Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. Today, I'm delighted we're going to be speaking to Janine Doggett, a freelance writer and blogger from Bristol who cycled La Jog solo via the Three Peaks in 2018. During this podcast, we learn more about Janine's journey into fitness, from running the London Marathon to training for her first Ironman. We learn why she started her blog, triathlove.com, and where she hopes to take it in the future. Janine shares more about her own personal fears, the anxiety she has dealt with, and who's inspired her to take on her big solo challenge. Hi, Janine. Hi. (laughs) Where are you based at the moment? I'm in Bristol. Oh, do you know, I've spoken to so many incredible women from Bristol at the moment. Every time I speak to someone, I was like, where do you live? They're like, Bristol, Bristol, Bristol. Yeah, it's a great city. It's, have you always lived there? No, I've only been here six years. So before that, I was I grew up near London um, and then spent a year in Australia. And then when I came back from there, I, I moved here. So. Oh, incredible. It sounds amazing. But Janine, before we start getting into all the amazing challenges and events that you have done, could you just introduce yourself and tell everybody a little bit more about you? Yeah, so um, I am a writer. So I've spent 15 years working in marketing. um, And now I'm a full time freelance copywriter um, and content person specializing in cycling and triathlon. So I do all kinds of stuff. But I realized a few years ago that my passion was triathlon and cycling. So that's where I focus my as much of my work as I can. Oh, fantastic. Were Were you sporty growing up? Uh, no, no, not at all. I think I've heard a lot of your podcasts and people often have the same background story. And, you know, the classic, I wasn't picked at school for netball. Um, I used to hide in the, ga- in the games room and, and have, you know, kind of period notes all the time as soon as I could forget <laughs> the games. Um, so I, I discovered running in my 20s. Um, my housemate was training for the London Marathon and he used to drag me out around London and I just remember having terrible stitch and a red face but the feeling when I got back was addictive and that's when I started to run. Oh I love it. So tell us a little bit more about your running journey then. Uh, So I yeah I I realised quite soon that it was really uh, the feeling when I got back I just remember feeling fantastic. Um, so it wasn't long before I signed up for my first marathon. I was always inspired by kind of the big stuff. And I signed up for London two, uh, 2008. Yeah, 2008. Um, and um, I ran it in 2009 because I ended up injured in training. Um, but that was the beginning of, a, of an endurance sport journey, really. Um, and, and more marathons and, um, and doing lots of half marathons. But I always ran on my own. I was I was never in a club or anything. And that, when I joined a club, that's when it that's when it kind of exploded. <laughs> what, what inspired you to join the club? I moved to Bristol and um, broke up with a boyfriend, and thought I wonder if there'll be any hot men at the club. So <laughs> <laughs> so I joined the club and I did meet a boyfriend. I didn't stay with him, but um, but uh, but, um, but you know in, in in joining a club and it wasn't just you know I, I joke it wasn't just the boy I I. Um, aspect I, I met a lot of friends and I, I still have very close friends now from Southfield Running Club in Bristol and um, and it was a way to integrate into the city and, and meet friends really. No absolutely it's like so so proactive and it's a great you know great thing to do to actually meet people who've got a similar interests and a mindset want to you know enjoy doing the same things that you do. So you obviously really enjoyed running why did you decide to make the transition over tri- to triathlon? Um, so again, I, I hear this quite a lot. I I got so into running that I went crazy on running and did did too much. And um, my kind of best and worst moment was when I I trained for a half marathon, did did a best time I've ever done. So I did a one thirty eight half marathon, which was really fast for me, maintaining seven and a half minute miles that long. I was like gobsmacked. And um, the next day, I was so excited that I went out and ran another half marathon on my own. <laughs> <laughs> and um I didn't stop and I got plantar fasciitis um aggressively in both feet um acutely and very fast so I remember stepping out and I felt like I had a knife like shoved up my heel and that would last a year and a half and um I was pretty depressed I I, I had taken away from me the thing I I loved it was part of my so my only social group really so it was a huge huge part of my life so I got a bike 
um, on the cycle to work scheme. Um, I rode my first road bike and, and I really got into swimming. So in the morning when my club mates were all out doing park run, I'd go to the local pool and then meet them afterwards for breakfast. Um, and I've always had a hankering for doing a triathlon because it always just sounded so cool to me. So it was really just the perfect opportunity to find a silver lining in this horrible injury and, um, and, and focus my efforts on my first triathlon. Oh, fantastic. Now you do, you've got an, intri- an incredible blog as well. Was, was the blog, the tr- triathlon? No, yeah. that, I'm saying that right, aren't I? Yeah. You're saying it right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Triathlon. Was that, was that because of you starting the triathlon? I mean, how does, how does that link together? So I, I, um, wanted to do an Ironman and I've read Chrissy Wellington's book um and that really inspired me to to kind of start the journey and then Chrissy Wellington came to talk at Bristol Cycle Festival and she left us with a message pay it forward I and I've never forgotten it she's so passionate if you hear Chrissy Wellington talk she is one of the most passionate infectious speakers and um and I started my blog um, and Anne signed up to my Ironman the, the, pretty much the day that I saw her. She signed my book and I was just, I went home, just full, you know, filled up with inspiration, started triathlon as a kind of, okay, here goes nothing. I've got a year to go to the Ironman that I've just signed up for. And it was really a documentation at the beginning of my own Ironman journey. Oh my God. Well, A, I, I know everybody's got massive girl crushes on Chrissy Wellington. I've never actually heard her talk, but it's great that, do you know what I think is amazing is that one message has stayed with you, pay it forward. And, and yeah, that's obviously had this massive impact on, on your life in terms of what you've gone on to, to go and do. And it all does have to start somewhere. So take us back to the, to the start of your triathlon journey. I mean, how are you feeling about everything? How are you yeah, like you signed up for your first Ironman. That's that's a huge step. I mean, I can't imagine, you know, what it was like once you hit that submit button. Um, I was, well, I was absolutely terrified. I, I remember, and, and excited, and the two things are often, as many of us know, quite closely related. And um, I remember after signing up, literally doing laps around my office, like as if I'd already done the Ironman. Like it was just, you know, I knew at that point it was going to happen. And that, that was so exciting for me. But then the fear set in and I would have literally nights where I, you know, wake up with nightmares. Um, um, so the, the, the kind of a part of my story, story which is really imp- um, important to the Ironman part of it and, and how that sort of changed things for me is that I've always had a very keen sense of uh, fear and um, put anxiety. I feel it's, I've always been quite an, an anxious person, quite, you know, adrenaline filled. But I've also... Um, the idea of doing an Ironman was terrifying to me. And I remember emailing my cousin who'd done one and saying, you know, um, am I going to die? <laughs> you know, were you worried that you were going to die? And he was like, no, I wasn't worried I was going to die. And I was like, okay, good. My cousin, my cousin wasn't worried. Like, I shouldn't be worried. <laughs> so I, I was genuinely um, afraid of, of the worst going into it um, for some reason. <laughs> You know, I think it's 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 perfectly normal, you know, to to feel that way because when you think about what an Iron Man is, it is a huge physical challenge. Not only physical, it, it's mental, and it you know it's going to end up taking over your life for that year. But you you know you did take the plunge. You're going to document your journey. You're going to blog about it. Um, where did you where did you even start? I mean, because I you know it's fun you know taking that first step hitting that submit submit and boom you've got your place it's booked it's sorted what was the next step for you so I bought Be Iron Fit which is a book by Don Fink which is known as the Iron Man Bible and I followed it to the letter so you get three programs to choose from and I and I picked the um just the not the just finished not the competitive but the one in the middle and um which meant a maximum um, training week of 18 hours um, instead of the 20 that you could kind of go up to um, and that was my security blanket I remember going to sleep reading it many nights I would I would almost you know hold it close to my chest as my as I say as my safety blanket and then about six months into my training I I did hit some walls doing it on my own um, and I hired a local coach um, called Llewellyn Holmes and he helped me to um to get to the finish line really from, from kind of six months in with a, with a bit of, um, more personalized training. When you say you hit some walls, what do you mean by that? 
Um, so there, there was a point where I had no energy at all and I, um, couldn't, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do the training that was down. And, um, at that point I realized I wasn't eating enough. Um, and I remember deciding to eat uh, two eggs for breakfast every morning from that point. And, um, and, and I felt like, you know, one of those, um, little wooden things that you press and they fall down and then you like let go and they like spring up. Um, that's kind of how it felt. I felt like suddenly I had this energy cause I was eating properly. And I think, um, I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't eating enough. I lost a lot of weight actually in the process of training for Ironman and, and I could, I felt like I couldn't eat enough basically. Um, so energy was a big problem for me. And were you still working full time as well while you were doing this? Yeah, I'd actually just started a brand new job and I was in the process of breaking up with a boyfriend. So there was a lot going on in my life. Um, I had moved into my mate's spare bedroom. Um, I just started a brand new job as a brand manager for a tea company. Um, so yeah, there was going a lot, uh, there was a lot going on. Um, so it's, yeah, it's hardly surprising that it was, you know, um, I wasn't, I was knackered (laughs) all the time. (laughs) Yeah. I I think people sort of underestimate, especially, you know, when you start a new job, meeting new people, it's, and you're, you know, trying to put your best foot forward, you're learning new systems. It's incredibly sort of mentally draining. And so you're being hit on that side, you know, breaking up with a boyfriend, emotionally draining, moving out of, you know, moving out of home, draining. It's just sucking all your energy and then doing high intensity training as well. So how did things change? Was it mainly the nutrition or when you got the local coach involved, did that, did it drastically change what you were doing? Um, I felt supported. I think that's the main thing. I, I would sometimes come back from a training ride and and feel so so wiped out I couldn't even move and I, me- I remember the brick sessions I would like come back from a you know a, a um the big one sort of like a se- 70 mile bike ride and then like have a nap and then go out for a 16 mile run and um and I just felt I had someone to text when I was panicking because of course it wasn't just about a lack of energy for me I was facing anxiety around the prospect of doing it too um and just having that extra support um was was huge really um someone just to talk to when when I needed it yeah in terms of managing your anxiety was there anything that you did during that training period which really helped you oh I'm trying to remember and just whether it was like you know like writing things down or journaling or you or did you get like a sense of satisfaction you know for for me for example being able to look back at say like my training blocks when I was doing MDS and seeing that I ticked off everything during that week and I could count up how many miles that I'd run how much speed training I'd done it gave me sort of like a sense of confidence um in doing it that way but was there anything specific that you sort of used to help you with your anxiety I would say that um the, the anxiety about it was always present and it was present until the, the next morning after my race when I woke up and realized that I was I'm still there and it was all good. Um, um, but methodically going through it and focusing on the, the aspects of it, you know, classically that I could control is what is, is what really kind of helped me. I, um, I did have um, a wall planner. Um, I, I, I'm not really big on Excel spreadsheets. So I, I didn't plan it like that, but I just literally wrote it on the wall and I counted up my hours every week. Um, and doing it methodically like that really helped. And meanwhile, I was blogging about it and I was writing when I had down times. Um, and I would also write a blog after every race I had leading up to it. And that the races leading up to it were also a huge, huge part of it because every time I did another one of the races, which I had to do in order to kind of progress to the distance I would hang the medal up on the wall and they they slowly accumulated um and a few weeks before the Ironman I was in Lanzarote at Club La Santa and I was the first lady in one of their mini triathlons and that was such a huge confidence boost it was the first time I'd ever inverted commas won anything I mean it wasn't a big race but just those landmarks that you get going towards it by, by simply doing you know you put the work in and and as if by magic, you see gains. And um, towards the end, I was stronger than I had ever been in my life. And I remember taking this photo and I just had a back like a bag of snakes, as my friend would say. 
But, but it's amazing what consistency can do, you know, putting in consistent performance. I mean, I think it's really interesting when you talked about, you know, the different walls that you sort of hit, getting, you know, a local coach involved, the blogging that you've done, you know, feeling supported, still dealing with the anxiety, but also doing these races so that you could see your progression. So you started this in 2014, Ironman 2015. Tell us about the Ironman, which one you did, why you chose it um, and what it was like. So I did Ironman Bolton. Um, it was on the 19th of July, 2015, and it rained all day. <laughs> and my friend and I, um, a guy in my running club was doing it as well. So um, I went with him and his wife. Um, and I didn't have anyone there to support me personally. Um, my family offered, but um, I decided it was best to just do it on my own. Um, and rather than drag them all the way up from Cornwall to, to Bolton, and um, that's where they're based. And the day itself was such a relief to get started after all of that thinking, all of that worrying, am I doing the right thing? What on earth am I doing? There's no way I can do this. But I've done the groundwork and now all I can do is is go for it. And that sense of relief as I, I remember standing in the, the queue, um, we were doing a rolling start into the water, um, into Pennington Flash. The rain was coming down really heavily, and I just remember a tear rolling down. Just everything that had been built up was here right now. And the sense of relief as I got into the water was, I remember it very keenly, so amazing. And I did a really strong swim, um, and I had a massive smile on my face as I came out of the water running towards T1. Um, and the the rain just increased Um it was very cold on the bike, very windy. Um, it rained all day. I did what I would now consider to be a pretty slow, a slow bike, um, almost eight hours on the bike that day. Um, very hilly. Um, but just ticking off the miles, getting onto that second lap was incredible. There's lots of support. And we went through this tunnel of people cheering and it just, you know, the hairs just stood up. It just felt like Tour de France moment. Um, and then by the time I got to T2 to rack my bike, I was so disorientated that I took ages to find it. Um, got the, my, even though my number was written on me like 12 times, exaggeration, maybe six times. Um, I still couldn't find my bike. I still was looking for the wrong number. And I think I, I was definitely disorientated. I said, I'd never want to see my bike again as I ran into T2. And I remember a load of people laughing at my, that was what, onlookers um, laughing um, in sympathy with me. And then I really chilled out in T2 a bit much. I like put on some sun cream. The sun was planning to come out at that point, due to come out. I was like, hey, does anyone want any sun cream? Like, I did a 15 minute transition. <laughs> but eventually got out onto the run I did a full change mentally I wanted to change everything I was wearing into a running kit which if I did it again I would just go through in one outfit to you know save time and the run was ups and downs classic second wind third wind fourth wind I wanted to run the whole marathon and being a runner I thought oh that's the easy bit for me I'll be able to run a marathon I was way harder than I could have imagined and I did hit some walls where i just felt like my legs did not want to move forward. Um, but I still did a marathon and I think it was about five hours. Um, and um, reaching that finish line was absolutely incredible. Um, but I did take a funny turn afterwards and um, I ended up in the hospital tent um, just being, um, they gave me some paracetamol and stuff. It was nothing serious, but I was like shivering quite violently and just had, I just had to had it all taken out of me, I guess. And, and at that point, the elation was kind of replaced with anxiety. Am I going to be okay? What's going on? <clears throat> um, yeah. I was going to say, it's, I mean, <laughs> ma massive congratulations. You know, it's such a huge, huge um, achievement. I, I love the, I love the transitions. You know, we'll just put this on some sunscreen, change your outfit, 15 minutes later. But obviously, a little, you know, crossing the finish line massive high then obviously a little bit fearful ending up in in the hospital tent because you had given it um your role when did it sort of finally sink in what you'd achieved or when did you did it take you long to recover from it so it 
it didn't take long at all, amazingly. And I put that down to the training being doing it by the book and doing it really well. And that's something that I haven't done since, um, which which other I think is the Iron Man effect. But I will say that it, it hit me pretty quickly that um the next morning I woke up and because I'd kind of made it through and I can't like um underestimate how I how I felt. I was properly anxious when I was in that tent. You know, I I was I said to the doctor, Am I gonna die? Uh, and the doctor said Yes, you will, but not tonight. <laughs> Thanks, doctor. Um, so the next day when I woke up with my medal, I was just like, yes, I've done it. And I have this memory of walking out of that hotel room in Bolton um, and just feeling like a, a, a new woman with a new kind of life to live. I, I could do anything. And I, it was huge, huge for me to finish it. What did you start thinking next? I mean, how soon did, was it a case of there's been a line drawn in the sand, you know, I suppose now as well, you've completed your, you've completed your Ironman, you've been in your job for now for maybe a year, um, hoping that you're over the heartbreak of the breakup with the, with the, with the boyfriend. And then was it a case of, right, what's next? Yes, yes. I think that doing doing it made me feel stronger, and I've and I've got this thing that I just I just call the Iron Man Swagger, which some people think is the Iron Man Shuffle, which means you can't run in, <laughs> when you're on an Iron Man. But the Iron Man Swagger for me is basically the way you feel for such a long time after doing it that you just have this kind of you know <laughs> untouchable swagger, and um, that lasted for me um, quite a long time. It helped me to, it gave me the confidence to move on, um, in many situations in my life that weren't working for me, gave me the confidence to move on from a relationship that wasn't working for me. Um, and, um, it also made me feel, um, that I could do anything. And the next year, that's basically what I did. Um, I did my first ultra marathon, I qualify for team G, you know, for the age group in triathlon. Um, I, I kind of came first lady at this half, half iron distance off-road duathlon, um, and got my first 10 K win. I, I did loads and loads of stuff the following year, but it, I didn't put the same training in that I did for Ironman. And I think that that, that does have an effect. Um, so preparation after that wasn't as good as it was for the Ironman, but I was left with this feeling that I could achieve anything. Do you know what, this is what I love is the it's the confidence that it got built up in you and I love that Iron Man swagger as well. I can almost sort of picture you just walking and having this confidence to to take on anything, an ultra marathon, a ten k. You know, congratulations for getting into Team GB for your age group in triathlon. That is absolutely fantastic. Talk us through one of the next, I suppose, bigger challenges that you decided to take on that sort of stretched you outside of your comfort zone. So part of the I can do anything feeling was I, I wanted to take on the next fear that kind of was holding me back in my life. And first up, that was heights. I've always believed I had a fear of heights. So the following year, amongst the kind of endurance sports stuff, I decided to do the three peaks. Um, and I did that across the year and as mostly as part of other kind of um, sporting events that I had kind of set up. So um for example, in December, I cycled to, from Bristol to Snowdon and then went up it at, when, when I got there uh, with some other um, amazing cycling friends. Um, um, and I, so that was the next fear. It's kind of ticked off. OK, cool. I've done the three peaks. I'm no longer afraid of heights. Um, what, and I did get some CBT for, for the fear of heights as well. So it was kind of a, you know, um, uh, tacked it from a few angles. But the big one for me, which I hadn't faced, was this fear of being um, isolated in um, on my own in places that I've had since I was a little girl. Um, and I have memories of kind of walking the long way around home from friends' houses, um, being afraid, even just being left in a car while mum might go into the post office. Um, um, babysitting in my teenage years, I remember feeling like actually it was scary being at in someone else's house by myself and these might be normal fears that lots of us have but I had become very good at cycling and swimming and running in groups and I just didn't let myself do it on my own but I craved I craved the feeling of what being on my own in the countryside but I was too scared to do it so that's that was the big challenge I wanted to face. How did you decide to go about doing that? I I think it was 
meeting Anna McNuff, I I emailed because because my blog turned into stories about other women, not just me, and that's what I always wanted it to be. Um, I emailed Anna and said, "Can I chat to you? I'd like to put, you know talk to you about um, a blog for my." Um, for triathlon and she happened to be in Bristol so we met up and had a pint um, and she told me about her trips and just listening to her talk about New Zealand and America made me think about how I could take this thing I want to do about being on my own and and turn it into a tangible idea and I had the idea to do um, a length of Britain sort of triathlon where I would cycle from Lands End to John O'Groats, climb, run up the three peaks on the way, and and swim in locks and lakes on the way up. That was the that was the idea. It didn't quite work out like that, but that's how it that's how it formed. And Anna said, you know, tell three people. And a, and a thing I remember that's really struck me is that she said, I am not different from you. I'm not different from anyone. The only difference is, you know, I'm not some brave superwoman the only difference is that I I just did it you know I just did it anyway even though I was scared and that really resonated with me she talks a lot about that in her TED talk um so that's what I knew I had to do just it the fear wasn't different because it was big for me um I just had to do it anyway (laughs) so I, I bought a a big map of Great Britain and pinned it up on my wall but it wasn't long before it got shelved and I, I kind of parked the idea for a bit and let it simmer in the background. <laughs> so a couple of really, really interesting things there that I want to go in. Firstly, Anna McNuff, total legend. She's been on Tough Girl Podcast twice. Love what she's done. If you haven't heard of Anna, you have to go and read her book, Pants of Perspective. She's run the full length of New Zealand. She's cycled all of the states in America. She cycled the Andes. Absolute inspiration. I was thinking, oh my God, to get one-on-one with Anna, absolutely amazing. But isn't it interesting, the two points that she said, which again sort of resonate, tell three people and not that she's nothing special, but she just did it. Um, so let's just come back to to your idea. You've bought this map of Great Britain. You want to uh, cy- you know, cycle the, the length of the UK, do Le Jog from Land's End to John O'Groats, you know, stop and climb the three highest mountains, swim in the lakes, etc. You've got this big map of Great Britain. Why did your idea get shelved? What, what stopped you from progressing it at that point? Um, well, partly because I was totally falling in love with my boyfriend and <laughs> nesting. Um, so I was, you know, finally, finally met a really, really great guy. And, and that was absolutely front of my mind for, 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 you know, most of kind of coming into 2017, really. Um, and, um, and also, I think it was kind of all too easy for it to just be this, this idea that, you know that just um it's just a bit of a silly idea and um I, I'm not really one of those people that, that can actually do that and it was just uh, yeah it was just too easy to just kind of but it was always there you know that's the thing it would always it was always there because I'm the sort of person that wakes up on New Year's Day and goes right right what this year you know and after Iron Man that really helped me to um think about what exciting ventures I could do every year or events so when 2018 rolled around, I um, had the opportunity to sign up, sign up for another Ironman event, distance event called Challenge Roth, um, which is actually the fastest um, Ironman course. It's where Chrissy Wellington's um, got her record, her world record. Um, and it's really hard to get into. And I was offered a um, place um, through work, which is amazing. Um, and all my friends were like, oh, you have to do it. You have to do it. You know, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, so I signed up for it. And I thought, you know, I can't do li- this triathlon idea and also um, Roth. But the, the truth is that my heart was definitely in this bigger fish I had to fry. I'd already done an Ironman. I do want to do a quicker Ironman one day. But right now, I knew that my heart was in this other thing. So I had to kind of go through the process of, you know get stopping the path to Roth and starting the path to the jog instead was that easy to do no I totally I I I definitely beat myself up with the idea of of pulling out of Roth um 
but I met up with a friend um, for a cocktail one night, a friend called Helen, and she said, just have to follow your heart. You know, this is your life. Do what makes you happy. And I kind of knew when she said that, that what I really wanted to do in my heart of hearts was Le Jog. So, so after a few sleepless nights, I, I pulled out of Challenge Roth um, and I said, right, I'm going to do it. And um, I took no action towards actually making it happen. But I said, I said I was going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> who did you tell did you tell three people yeah well I, I I didn't stick to that I think I told my boyfriend um and I'm hoping he was supportive or else it's time to get a new boyfriend <laughs> yeah he was very supportive um and um and then I told quietly told um most running club friends really and cycling friends who who we, who I would just chat about when they would say oh, are you doing rock still and I'd be like oh no actually I'm doing this so I so I started being a bit braver and just talking about it and then kind of as I said it I, I felt every time I said it I in the back of my mind I was like are you really there is this really gonna happen <laughs> and then there was one day a few weeks out of of um of the time I wanted to do it um and James my boyfriend said are you actually gonna do this thing are you are you gonna cycle from London to John O'Groats or I was like yeah yeah I'll do it yeah he's like it was just you've not done any planning <laughs> and I was like Oh, yeah, but it's not going to take much planning, is it? And that day, literally that day, I, I, I started route mapping the first bit and looking at accommodation. And I was like, oh, I think it's quite a big job, actually. <laughs> so I booked my first night accommodation at, um, at um, a hostel. Um, and that's when it, it became real. And he's like, OK, cool, you are doing it. <laughs> I was, say, I, just, I was just going to come back to the, the telling um, the telling the three people because I think it's really interesting. I mean, uh, I think you've got to be very selective over who you do tell first of all because I think um, you, you've got to pick the people who are going to be supportive and encouraging. And I think, you know, selectively, very clever of you, you know, to pick the people from your your tri club who, who know you, who know what you've accomplished and will, you know, be able to understand your motivation and your drivers. I know that I'm very, very selective with the individuals that I tell about my ideas for next challenges because sometimes like the idea can be so fragile that it can just be crushed with you know one word one look or one phrase it's like oh you really don't you think that's a bit stupid or crazy or why do you think you can do it um so you started route planning realized it's quite a big job but you've got your first night's accommodation book which is fantastic when did you when did you decide that you were going to start the challenge did you have like a deal um, a deadline date so i as this, as the idea was kind of simmering away, but getting warmer, I think an important point point is that I, I was not enjoying my job and I was really struggling at, at work to to kind of just get through the days at one point. And I would listen to Tough Girl podcasts on my way to work almost every morning. I had an hour's walk to work and I would listen to it and listen to the stories of people who switched their job, you know, we quit their jobs and, and did something and and just did it. And so for me, that was part of it because my work wouldn't allow me to have three weeks off. And I decided it was going to take me three weeks to do it because I didn't, um, because I was going by the three peaks and I didn't want to put myself massively out of my comfort zone. So that became part of it. And obviously the timings of it, um, became reliant on, um, notice periods and what have you. Um, so it was a big decision, but I quit my job and, um, decided to go freelance again, as I had been before, before I, I started working uh, um, full time again, um, and so it was earmarked that I would go on the first of June, um, and that it would uh, yeah take me three weeks. So that's how I came to that date. Fantastic. Now, one of the interesting things as well is you you talked about the reason for doing the jog, the challenge with the three peaks was to do it solo was to get over this anxiety that you had of you know doing things by yourself how were you managing that anxiety during this process before you headed off not very well I was um it was there the whole time and I was constantly waking up in the night and and honestly feeling like I I had taken on something that that would would be you know genuinely dangerous or that because that's where the fear is coming from um so I was going through the motions of planning it 
But as it got closer, I would put little calls for help out, um, WhatsApp groups. Hey, I'm cycling from here to here on this day. Does anyone want to come? Uh, or does anyone want to do it with me? <laughs> and um, and it, more and more, it, it was just being proven to me that this was a, this was the time for me to do it on my own because there wasn't a lot happening in that in that um, regard. So um, I was terrified, and it, as it as it drew closer, and I I met someone who showed me how to uh, map using Ride with GPS, and um, so I plotted the route, and it was thousands. 1109 miles in total and I uh, had a spreadsheet um and um had all my accommodation booked um and um I, I must say as well that it, as part of this process um and what your point a minute ago was so so right and so interesting because it hadn't occurred to me that telling people who didn't understand or who were also scared could be detrimental um and so when I did tell more people about it I did get some negative feedback and that that confirmed all my fears to the point where I I just felt like I was doing the wrong thing. Um I posted on the Adventure Queens group and got about 100 replies <laughs> saying you'll be fine. You know, this isn't your fear that you're unless you've got any proof, um you know, you haven't got evidence that that this is is actually these things that you're worrying about are going to happen to you. You're going to have a great time, you're going to meet amazing people. So it was really going back to the people who who did support and did understand that, that, that got me to start, really. Um, and probably also people who've done challenges, you know, solo by themselves, whether, you know, whether it's doing the jog or, or running or cycling, and have actually exper- have experienced it and gone through something similar. Those are the people that you want to be listening to instead of people who've never probably undertaken a big physical challenge and stepped outside of their comfort zone. So um, well done for reaching out. And the Adventure Queens, if you haven't heard about it, is an incredibly supportive Facebook group that Anna McNuff runs with her friend, um, Emma Crompton. I hope that name is right. I de- it's definitely Emma. I can't remember if her surname is Crompton. But again, well worth checking out to get that support um, and having that place where you can go because otherwise it can feel very isolating when you want to say I want to cycle the job and climb uh, and climb the highest mountains um, in England Wales and Scotland so t- take us back to to this to this journey to starting out and did your feelings of anxiety change as you went on did you gain in confidence it was um it fluctuated um so I had kind of imagined the moment where my boyfriend would drive off from Land's End and I would just be there so many times. And when that, as it, as it was, as it neared, that was the hardest part. Um, but then as soon as he left and I was on my own, you know, the kind of practical stuff kicked in and I felt okay. I felt pretty good. And, um, I was kind of immersed in, um, checking the route and eating and drinking and, um, and saying hello to people and just getting into a rhythm. Um, so it it really was up and down. I think Cornwall and Devon I felt more familiar um, with because my my parents live in Cornwall. And um, the isolated country lanes were tough, but I felt okay. And I was able to stop and smile and just be like, okay, I'm here. That's, that's cool. I'm, you know, here I am. It was when I got to Wales that I felt it really kicked in the isolation kicked in and it was quite gray um in the morning and there was no one around and I had this big day ahead of me where I was just going to be all on my own and I I had my first kind of panic attack really um I wouldn't say actual panic attack but but I felt quite panicky really I was crying and there was you know very nervous and um in in Bilf Wells and I had to get to McKinkliff that day and a friend of mine, um, Elle, had basically had had put a shout out on Twitter, and this woman, amazing woman, um, Polly, met me a, a few, you know, about twenty or thirty miles later, and and cycled with me that day, and that was kind of the start of realizing that this adventure wasn't just going to be me and my mind; other stuff was going to happen too, and I, you know, I was meeting new people, and so it was definitely ups and downs. In total, I cycled, you know, a couple of hundred, maybe 300 miles, actually, with other people and the rest of it on my own. And that was all part of it, really, like meeting these amazing people on the way. 
you know, look at, looking back now on, on what you've achieved, what do you think you've learned the most about going on that solo challenge and doing Le Jog? I think that I, the thing I've learned the most is that just starting is is so important. And I, I gained a lot of confidence and a lot of pride because I, I just started. I didn't, it didn't go perfectly to plan. And I felt at the end that it would, it could have been easy to beat myself up because, because it didn't go to plan. So what happened was I obviously didn't cycle all of it solo for a start, um, which was fine, but the plan was to cycle it solo. And my route mapping wasn't as good as it could have been. When I got to Scotland, I had a choice between, uh, well, I had only a choice of a dan- of an extremely dangerous road, which I couldn't cycle on. It was it was um, just uncyclable. So I had to catch a train to get back to a road that was safer. And that took my mileage down from 1,109 to basically like 1,009. So I still hit the 1,000 mile target, but I felt like a fraud and I felt like I'm, um, um, it took the shine off, it took the shine off it for me. So I had a lot of thinking around that aspect. And then I realized that the well, the thing I'm not most, it's not about how far I cycled and it's not about completing the challenge um, without any kind of breaks in the journey. It's about the fact that I did actually just start and that that's kind of a really big thing. And it helps me to realize that I can do I can do I can do stuff and I can push push the fear really I mean please do not beat yourself up (laughs) about that I mean the fact is you made you were out there you made an incredibly sensible mature decision because sometimes it's not about the challenge at all costs it's about balancing the the risks and that's what you did an incredibly dangerous road or you can catch a train to a safer road and you 100% made the right decision um, to do that. And, and secondly, you know, doing the whole thing solo, the fact is you did 700 miles solo, you know, day after day you were out there by yourself and it shouldn't take away anything, the fact that you got to ride with people occasionally for 30 miles, like, you know, here and there or a day here and there because you still planned it, you still executed it, you still showed up, you still did this challenge, which is absolutely incredible how did how did you celebrate when you when you finished it I had plans in um a few girls coming over to the house uh, to have a few drinks quite late on um just a kind of impromptu it was my birthday when I got home as well um and um having that to look forward to was amazing um and I spoke to a lady on the phone who had uh, done solo the jog uh, the year before called Nikki, and she recommended that I get the um, Caledonian sleeper home. And that was the best suggestion ever because getting the Caledonian sleeper from Inverness to London was just such a great experience and a really great way to celebrate. I got a little mini bottle of champagne, had it in my cabin. And then when I got home to Bristol, oh, I just felt amazing and surreal, really, being home. And um, yeah. I had some cocktails and really celebrated and my friends were lovely and I got the congratulations cards and stuff. So. I'd, you know, I'd love to, I'd love to hear more about your blog triathlon because it's not just, it's not just a blog about you and your challenges and your journeys that you've been on, but you are sharing loads of stories of other women who are going out there doing incredible challenges. Do you just want to tell us a little bit more about how the blogs evolved? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my dream for triathlon has always been, and it's not, it's not there yet by any stretch. Um, but it's always been to celebrate women who swim, cycle and run. And, uh, much like you're doing and much like Adventure Queens is doing, I've always had the idea to have kind of a book called the iron women where I, basically it's like a coffee table book and about different women's stories who've done Ironman events and like how it's sort of changed their lives for the book better or, or how just about their journey really. So I, interview women to talk about what they've done and um and then write it up and, and, and pop it on triathlon and also it's a blog for my own it's a kind of place to keep to keep track of all my own of my own challenges as well so there's there's lots of kind of race reports on there and stuff 
I've got bigger plans for it to kind of get it get it up, um, going again, really. But at the moment, it's kind of a it's been a bit quiet recently, obviously. So how does it work? Are you interviewing? Is it new interviews every month, every week? And and how many interviews have you done, or how many different stories are on there? There's lots and lots on there. I don't know exactly how many. Gosh, maybe forty or something. But there's no regularity to it at the moment, um, and that's what I need to kind of change and just start putting a bit more bit more. Um, structure around it really yeah now I don't want you to play favorites and I know this is a (laughs) tough 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 question because I get this asked this all the time um but are there any stories or any interviews that you've done um that stand out for you that or that has resonated with you personally um or whether it's a word some event um a story a challenge that you could share oh when I spoke to Paula Craig um that was incredible I don't know if you've spoken to her but she's an age group triathlete who um um, had a life-changing accident when when she was training and um lost her use of her legs and then went on to do age group uh in a wheelchair and talking to her was incredible she was so so inspiring and um she's she was just an uh, amazingly inspiring woman so that one was was amazing um and another story that I that I'll I'll never forget was Emma who was depressed and had tried to take her own life on a multiple occasions uh, and then she was in the party kind of scene in, in London and then when she did her first Ironman she really said that that was a big big uh, change for her in her life and um although the path after that wasn't linear um she's still now doing triathlon and loving it. <laughs> so that was um, incredible. And the the thing about that story is that it meant so much to her to finally tell it. And she shared it on her Facebook and people for the first time were discovering that she had gone through all of this and it was a huge thing for her. So that was amazing to share that with her. Absolutely. I think it's it's really interesting because sometimes people don't necessarily know everyone's backstories and will almost make assumptions. Oh, it's easy for her because of X or Y. I mean, I remember having that with uh, when I spoke with a lady called Rachel Cullen and everyone, uh, everyone just said, oh, it's just so easy for you. You're such a good runner. And you know, when she shared her book, you know, Running for My Life, it was suddenly like everyone was like, whoa okay this is the challenges that you've been through this is the journey that you've been on it's just absolutely inspiring I mean I'm so pleased that you're doing what you're doing because it's just great to get more stories more more women's stories out there about women who do you know who do run who boot who do bike who do swim and it, it's inspiring because it is you know it's all ages it's all backgrounds and, and that's what that's what you want really mm. what's next for you well, I'm. I've been really struggling to write a blog about about Le Jog because the Le Jog blog, <laughs> right? <laughs> Sorry, um, <laughs> because there's so much to say, and every time I try and write a blog, I end up writing way too much. So I've actually written twenty five thousand words about it, and um, I think that's going to turn into a book. And just because I I want to um, just write it all down, I've got so much to write about it. So much stuff happens that, you know, obviously we had, haven't covered. Um, I think one of the most amazing moments was when someone I'd never met turned up with a support van to, to support me for 40 miles in um, in, her, in um, Storm Storm Hector, an amazing woman called Rachel. And kind of stuff like that happened that I could never have imagined. So that's um, while kind of uh, working on my business, that's, that's, a, that's something else I'm doing on project and also doing the Iron Woman project and actually kind of putting the JFDI that I got that I put into starting the cycle ride and actually putting that into the project but from a physical perspective um I want to integrate the solo cycling on a smaller way and then and then normalize it for myself basically that's that's the big challenge it's not a big challenge if that makes sense it is a big challenge don't um <laughs> you know what I mean don't, don't diminish yeah. it it's, it is a big challenge yeah 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 I think it's just about going like this weekend I'd like to go and cycle in Wales on my own and then take what I've learned from this trip and go and, and keep doing it really and uh, yeah so for the moment it's not it's not the kind of what next cycle across another country but 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 how can I yeah how can I make this part of my life in a really positive way and you know what would be really powerful as well is is for you to continue to share that because there's going to there's 
there's definitely other women out there who are, you know, apprehensive or scared or fearful about doing challenges solo. So actually, you know, you learning this for yourself and, you know, figuring out how to do it and or how best for you to do it and to get those tips and tricks can encourage other women to think, okay, right, that's that's what she did. This is what I can do. Okay, how can um, how can I implement that into 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 my life as well? So, yeah, that sounds fun. Do you just want to give a shout out to your blog and where you are on social media? The blog is triathlon dot com, and I am um, Miss Janine Elizabeth on Instagram um, and Janine Dogger on Twitter. Fantastic. And I'll make sure I put all of your links to your blog, to your social media at toughgirlchallenges.com so people can come and find you, come and support you and come and read about all these incredible women that you are interviewing on your blog. Thank you. Before we go, any final words of wisdom or final words of of advice that you want to leave our listeners with? Yeah, I think um, I feel like if I could start that, then anyone can. So if you've got something that you don't want to do because you're a bit afraid to do it, then then challenging that I think is really possible and there's so much to be gained from it. The other thing I wanted to mention that we haven't covered here is what happens afterwards. And I did feel a bit depressed when I got back. And I know obviously I had no job to go back to because that was kind of part of what, of what happened. And I'm writing it, writing it about it is, is definitely helping. I do have a kind of excitement about what next and that, that doesn't go away. But there is, I believe, I think it's quite common to have a big dip after you do a big event. And I'm sure that you'll know about this. I don't know how you've experienced it. Um, But it was a bit of a shock to me. I wasn't expecting it to be quite as bleak as it felt at times. I think that's something that perhaps we need to talk more about, actually. It's kind of what happens afterwards. And so, yeah, not wanting to leave on a negative note because it is really, really positive. But I think that that's kind of something important to talk about as well. I think the adventure blues is a very common phenomenon and especially after you finish like a challenge or or a race or complete something that you've spent a year of your life 18 months of your life going after there is going to be this drop I mean and for me I personally I just felt like after the Appalachian Trail the struggle for me was I didn't have a purpose and then that had knock-on consequences in terms of Uh, training diet fitness how I was feeling about myself and I think it's something that is to be expected but it's also to be like it's okay to have to go through that as well and that you will come out the other side are you are you still in it now or are you are you out of it definitely coming out and it it's obviously not been it's been three three weeks since I arrived at at John O'Grove so it still has been a bit fluctuating but I will say that what I realized is that it's a there's a bit of an analogy kind of like on the trip. Um, whenever I was having a bad time, I, I grew to learn that that would pass. And it was like a black cloud that passes and then the sun comes out. And I realized that this is absolutely no different and exactly what you just said it, in that you have, you know, it will pass and it is OK to feel like it basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And don't feel guilty if you want to <laughs> get into bed in your pajamas with a box of chocolate, <laughs> yeah. put Netflix on, watch movies, and not yeah. do not do anything. You ca- you know you're allowed to not be productive. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, but I was going to yeah. say like you you um, not to. Oh my god, we don't want to end on a depressive note. We need to turn around. No. <laughs> but I was going to say um, you know especially now that you're you're becoming self employed and you've been self employed before. I think that can make it even more challenging because, I mean, I definitely feel if I'm not working, if I'm not working on my business, if I'm not doing something to help Tough Girl Challenges grow and grow and develop and get bigger, it's like, come on, Sarah, you're not where you want to be. And the only person who can change it is you. And so it can be very difficult to to be like, okay, I'm I'm just going to watch Netflix now and and not feel guilty. But actually, you do need to have that that downtime and be be kind to yourself. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. No, that that is all part of it. So yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. oh fabulous um janine thank you so much for coming on top of our podcast to, to share your story really appreciate it absolute inspiration you've been so open and honest about what you've been through and what you've learned along the way i know it's going to help other women to tackle their own personal challenges thank you so much thanks so much sarah
tribe. I hope that has inspired you to think about your own personal challenge, whether that's going to be running a marathon or taking on an Ironman or doing a solo challenge. And that could be a massive solo challenge like cycling the jog, or it could be going wild camping for the first time. Remember, this is not about a comparison. This is about finding a challenge that motivates and inspires you. It's about getting you excited about stepping outside your comfort zone. We've obviously been talking about triathlon and doing an Ironman. I just want to give you some recommendations about previous podcast episodes that you can listen to in order to get further advice and tips about stepping outside your comfort zone and doing a triathlon. We've spoken to an incredible range of women of different ages, of different backgrounds, of different stories who've gone on to do an Ironman or gone on to to do a triathlon. We've spoken with Helen Croydon quite recently. This girl ran at Tales of a Party Girl turned triathlete, how Helen turns her life around. We've also spoken with Susie Cheatham, who's a professional triathlete and came six at the Ironman World Championships. We've talked with Jen Brown, who's a running and triathlon coach and founder of Sparta Chicks. Um, if you are looking for more podcasts to listen to, I'd highly recommend you go and listen to Sparta Chicks. Jen interviews incredible women as well, absolutely inspiring podcasts. We've talked with Paris Edwards as well, another triathlete who actually was behind the story that I think I tell quite a lot, which is Be The Egg. So if you haven't heard of that before, but you've maybe heard it mentioned either in Facebook posts or um, or on podcast episodes, you know, and you're trying to figure out what does Be The Egg mean, then take a listen to the episode with Paris Edwards. We've also spoken with coaches as well. So Gail Bernhardt, well worth listening to Gail as she talks more about what goes on behind the scenes and how it took her 10 years to accomplish her coaching goal. We've talked with Helen Russell as well. Um, Rachel Bowen, Helene Rossiter. Helene is a triathlete, a runner, explorer, and she also quit her job, bought a van and um, traveled around Europe. Hashtag where wheels go. Very inspiring stories. Well, we've got lots of inspiring stories on the Tough Girl podcast. Just want to do a quick mention to a previous Tough Girl, Stacey Copeland, who recently became the first ever British female boxer to win a Commonwealth title, which is absolutely huge. And what I love about Stacey's story is that when she first started boxing when she was a little girl when she was six years old it wasn't actually legal for girls to box and now she's become the first British woman to win a commonwealth title it just shows you what you can achieve with hard work when you've got a dream and you go after it with everything you've got and Stacey has had a number of setbacks um, from from injury from fights being cancelled but she has persevered she's also working on a great initiative as well which I'm involved in called hashtag pave the way it's all about motivating encouraging other girls and women to go into sports and for other women to pave the way for other women coming up behind them and Stacey is doing that absolutely incredible performance now new episodes of the tough girl podcast come out every Tuesday at 7 a.m uk time and we've got an incredible lineup coming up from Jane Harris to Katie Parrott to Jessica Hepburn um, as well as who else have I got on there? Sophie Hollingsworth, Larry Davis, Nikki Barnard. So we've got an incredible group of women coming up over the next um, next few weeks. But next week it's going to be an episode with me. Now I haven't quite decided if it's going to be a solo episode or if I'm going to be interviewed. Um, but basically, what I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to be talking and sharing more about my next big challenge, which is cycling from Vancouver all the way down to Mexico to Cabo. That's going to be via the Pacific Coast High highway and the Baja divide. So I'm going to be talking more about the planning and the preparation. Um, how I planned and prepared for this journey, where I've got the money from, um, how I've managed to balance the you know the podcast, running Tough Girl Challenges, as well as writing my dissertation. So 20,000 words on women adventure and fear to finish off my master's before I head off. Um, I will be opening up to any questions that you may have. So if you've got any questions, then please do send me an email, sarah at toughgirlchallenges.com. You can also send me a direct message on Facebook. Um, or contact me on Twitter. I'm I am all over social media, so you should be able to find me. But please do go check out toughgirlchallenges.com because there you can find more information about me, my backstory, the previous challenges that I've done from running the Marathon de Sables to through hiking the Appalachian Trail in 100 days. I have written um, three books. I've written a book on Tough Girl Sahara Challenge. I've written another book on climbing Kilimanjaro and a third book on chalet hosting, providing top tips and information if you want to go off and do a ski season. 
I, one of the things that I, you know, I couldn't do this without all of the help and support of the patrons who every single month are supporting me financially. And what that involves is the equivalent of basically buying me a coffee um, every month or basically paying for the content that you're listening to, whether that's $2 a month to $10 a month to $25 a month, because it really does add up. All of these individual contributions allow me to fund the running costs of the Tough Girl po- podcast, allows me to fund the running costs of the website. It allows me to increase the amount of female role models in the media it allows me to do these interviews to edit these interviews and to put this content out there and I honestly couldn't do it without you and on the website there is actually a dedicated patrons page to every single person who has who is supporting the tough girl podcast there's over 200 patrons now which is absolutely incredible there is a big push you know obviously the more patrons I can get the the more I, I can do in this space and the And to be honest, it it also manages to take a lot of pressure off me in terms of having to earn money. So I'm not spending my time washing dishes. I'm not spending my time doing interviews for Camp America. I can just invest my time in growing and building Tough Girl Challenges for you, the listener, because you are so important to me. And I hope that you get some value from listening to this podcast every week. Please do become a patron. Go and check out patreon.com forward slash tough girl podcast. And that's patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash tough girl podcast there are links um, on my twitter page there are also links on the website it makes a huge difference but thank you again for listening have an incredible week have an incredible day wherever you are and i'll be back with you next tuesday for another awesome episode of the tough girl podcast take care lots of love bye <laughs>